and give you a little bit of an overview of the the P3 model. And I'm also going to then focus on the uh, the really this group for this presentation, which is the Strazen and Holyrood neighborhoods. Uh, Eric's going to take you through the train testing uh, update, and then it's going to flip back to me, and I'm going to walk you through a number of the different project features uh, along the alignment. We'll talk a little bit about safety, and we'll also touch on the uh, COVID response and what Transit's doing to keep our workforce and the community safe. And then at the very end, as Isabel mentioned, we'll regroup and go through the questions that you're submitting as we uh, go through this presentation. So just a reminder, uh, send in your questions. Uh, if I've talked about something or if Eric has mentioned something that's got your attention and maybe we didn't fully explain it, it's a great opportunity for you to ask a question and we'll, we will revisit it at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. This is a uh, P3 project. It stands for Public-Private Partnership. We're very proud to be uh, partners with the City of Edmonton uh, in this endeavor. This is the largest construction project for the city, the first P3 project for the city as well. Uh, so that's kind of exciting and, and lots of learning for all of us on both sides, but we're having a great time doing it in the last few years and, and the relationship is strong. Uh, I would also mention that TransEd itself is made up of multiple companies. TransEd is a partnership between Bechtel, Alice Dawn, Bombardier, and Fengate. Fengate is the uh, financing group. So this portion of the valley line, the first phase or the southeast portion, is 13 kilometers long. It starts down in the Millwoods area and then heads to downtown, uh, where it will eventually be extended through the second phase, which is valley line to the west, of which the city is currently in the uh, procurement phase for that right now. So along our portion is uh, 11 train stops. We're going to talk about them today in, in a fair amount of detail. Uh, and then there's also one very unique elevated station, uh, which is incorporated with a transit station and a 1300 stall park and ride. And that's in the uh, area of 75th Street and Wagner Road. So we'll give you some highlights of that and some photos as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's continue. So I'm going to focus on Strathern and Hollywood right now. So thanks to those of you that are listening right now that are from that neighborhood. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time so that we can walk you through the status of your particular areas. So I'm going to take you through some roadworks update. I'm going to talk a bit about Connors Road. I'm going to highlight a little bit of information on the landscaping and uh, particularly some of the remaining landscaping for some of the, uh, the residents along there. We're going to introduce you to the overhead catenary system. Eric's going to give a bit more detail on that later in the presentation. And we'll also talk about the train stops uh, at Holyrood and on Strathern. Uh, and then lastly, we'll we'll show you some of the overall maps. Um, you'll probably recognize them when we get to that section just to help you understand some of the traffic flows and the accessibility for vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists in these two neighborhoods. So right off the bat, let's talk about uh, roads and Connors Hill. So on the left side of your photo is the current condition of the new intersection of 95th and Connors Road. Now, as you can see here, it's not fully open, but it's looking very complete, very close to completion. So I've reached out to our construction group just uh, actually this afternoon to get an update. We're actively working in that area right now. And our goal is to, you know, unless the, the snow lands a little too early or the ground freezes a little bit too early, we fully intend to uh, turn this intersection on. And what I mean by that is really activate the signals and complete the last of the road work tie-in so that this connection can be made. Now, if you're familiar with this area, you know that you're driving over top of the, uh, of the rail over steel plates right now in a temporary location, just a little bit to the east of what you're looking at in the photo here. Our goal is to get that removed and, and initiate the, the permanent alignment, as we call it, uh, very late this fall. On the right-hand side of the photo, you can see some of the very last pieces of track construction along the entire 13 kilometers. This is the last connecting piece. So we're at the top of Connors Hill here. We're just completing the uh, the track concrete work and we'll be laying the embedded rail in those slots that you can see in the photo in the coming days. Again, this is uh, the last area and this will be completed this fall. That photo was taken today, just as to give you an, an idea of how current that is. And today is the 14th of October, if you're tuning in um, sometime down the road. All right, let's take a look at the next slide, which is some more about the roadworks uh, along 85th, sorry, 95th Avenue and also 85th Street, particularly the intersection that you see in the right-hand side there. So those of you that live in the Strathern area will know that we had shut down uh, 95th Avenue for the duration of summer 2019 last year. 
completed the uh, the vast majority of the work uh, with that road close last year, and we're, we're very thankful and remain very thankful to the neighborhood for allowing us to do that. You know, it wasn't easy. It was a challenge for the businesses, but uh, we do appreciate the ability to to have done that. That allowed us to have a really good footing for this year's work, which really transitioned into the uh, the train systems and rail installation. And in the photo here, as you can see, the Stratton stop itself. So uh, that work is ongoing. The access along this road has been maintained all summer long. Uh, I will point out that there is a little bit of concrete pours that are occurring. Uh, I think they started last night, in fact, and they'll go on overnight for the next two weeks at the most. And that is to complete the center concrete medians. You'll know that there's some gaps along there that are getting filled in with concrete in the coming weeks uh, here. So that shouldn't take us too long. That will really see the end of any active construction that creates noise and, and a lot of disruption uh, along 95th Avenue for the duration of the winter. We will be doing work along there and Eric will describe it here in a bit to do with the systems installation, which is all of the cabling and the, the communications wires and the overhead power and that sort of thing uh, throughout the winter. And we'll be doing a lot of that work around the stop. Uh, you can see the intersection at 85th and 95th, not a whole lot to note here other than the, the signals are going in and they will be turned on at some point here through the winter as well. All right, moving to the next slide. Talking a little bit about landscaping. So of course, a lot of this was started last year and a good chunk of it, uh, the vast majority of it, in fact, was done this year. Um, you can see in these photos, a lot of interesting, different varieties, I guess, of, of shrubs uh, and of trees. I, I can tell you that right along the entire 13 kilometers was about 85,000 shrubs that we're planting and about 10,800 trees. Uh, we're planting them in ways that kind of bring a bit of visual interest. And what that means is different foliage, different leaf colors uh, and, and uh, textures and designed in such a way that there's some patterning, as you can see in the photo here, and also designed in such a way that even in the winter, it creates a bit of visual interest as well and kind of helps counter the, the white and brown that Edmonton is used to seeing in the winter. So we're really proud of that. I think as you drive the alignment, you're probably starting to notice there's a great deal of landscaping. So much of that was done this year. You can see in the photo on the right, there are some residences still that we are needing to tie in their properties to the back of the sidewalk. That work uh, will continue this fall. Some of it may carry over into next year as well. Uh, if you happen to be a resident along there, you can reach out to our information line or, or by email to us, and we can give you some further information on the specifics, particularly to, uh, you know, to your property. Um, moving on to the next slide then. So what we're looking at here now is, as I mentioned, a bit of the overhead catenary system and the stop. So I'm going to let Eric talk about this in a little bit, but I just want to highlight that you'll see a lot of activity or have been seeing a lot of activity along 85th Street and 95th Avenue in the last month or so. That will continue through the winter as we put up these cables. Uh, you can see a good shot of the Strathern, sorry, that's the Hollywood stop on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, that particular stop is progressing much like uh, all the other stops along the alignment. You can see the roofs are going in. We recently poured the curves that uh, surround the shelters that will go in this place as well. We'll show you some photos of some uh, shelters being constructed at other areas along the alignment later on in the presentation. All right, moving to the next slide. What I want to show here again is just some more, oh, I guess it's some more train stops. Excuse me, we love our uh, our stops. So we got a couple more pictures here just to give you a, a bit of a feel of what they look like. So uh, one of the things I'll point out here, and Eric will talk about it more, is the silver cabinets on the, the photo on your right. That is an indication to you that work is progressing in the area. And what I mean by progressing, I guess, is it's some of the hidden work. What we've seen in the last few years is a lot of surface work, a lot of roadway and, and track construction that's very obvious and very easy to see the progress. What's not as easy to see is the pulling of the cables and installing all of that um, electrical infrastructure. So when you see the cabinets go in, what that tells you is that it's giving us the location where those cables terminate and where those uh, wires are connected into the into the system. So you've got to have the cabinet there first. That allows us to continue with the cable pulling and it helps you understand and, and get a bit of a visual indication of where that work is occurring. Moving on to the next photo, I want to show you here the overview of 95th Avenue, particularly at the connection 
to Connors Road. Now we saw a picture of that a few slides ago. I just want to remind people that the configuration in that area, particularly Strathern Drive and Cloverdale Hill, is changing slightly. Um, there will be a one lane, one uh, direction travel heading, we'll call it down the hill or um, north, I suppose, north down Cloverdale Hill and north down Strathern Drive. Uh, that is a bit of a change from what you've seen in the past there. You can see a, an illustration also of your 95th Avenue westbound movement and how it connects to Connors Road. You'll have to turn left there at the signal, crosses the tracks, and then a right or a left to go up or down Connors Road. Um, so you're probably familiar with that. You've seen that come into shape here in the last little while. We just wanted to point out this uh, this drawing. Now, of course, this is something you've probably seen in the past. These, this comes out of a city's publication from many years ago. Uh, and we just find it's helpful in showing people the various traffic lanes and movements and turning lanes and that sort of thing. On to the next slide, we're going to take a look over at the very other end of 95th, over by the former um, Bonnie Dune traffic circle. Uh, not a whole lot to say here other than if you've been driving by there lately, you'll see that a lot of those side street connections in front of the emergency medical services building is well underway and, and virtually complete. I think it's open to traffic now as well. 85th Street connection has been made. Uh, just a reminder that anybody going north on 85th Street will have to go east or west along 90th Avenue or Connors Road and from that location will not be able to turn left and go north along 85th Street. So a bit of change in the geometry there, you're probably likely getting used to that now, but as you can see in the last few weeks, it's it's starting to look complete. All right, I think the next slide now, I'm gonna kick it over to Eric, and he's gonna take you through some of the trains, uh, systems and the testing processes that Bombardier, uh, again, as I mentioned, one of the partners of TransEd is actively engaging right now. So take it away, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Dallas, appreciate it very much. So if we can go to the next slide. So one of the things that's really interesting, uh, we're receiving uh, our trains and we're continuing to receive them. We're expecting to have all 26 train uh, by uh, the end of the year. Uh, so uh, train 17 and 18 and some of the recent arrival, uh, and you'll notice uh, the way that they're being delivered. So first, uh, they come on, uh, come in by freight trains, and we have a dedicated uh, support platform that's installed over uh, those uh, freight trains, and it travels directly from Kingston all the way to uh, the Edmonton uh, yard. And from there, we're actually uh, transferring it into a special, uh, a specialized truck bed uh, that will allow us to actually uh, transfer it all the way to uh, the uh, White Mud uh, uh, OMF station. Uh, and we basically roll it off uh, from that bed uh, and uh, bring it to the barn. So quite an interesting uh, you know, set of activities when we're receiving a train. Typically, we do that at night because we don't want to disturb, uh, you know, the normal traffic. Uh, so it gets done in the wee hours of the night. Uh, and we do that specifically to make sure that we don't uh, disrupt, you know, your your day coming, uh, you know, into work and uh, moving around during the day. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we, as we basically go into the dynamic testing, and here you have some example of what was done uh, last winter. So it gives you a bit of a... Uh, forbearing taste of what it's going to look like as we're running into the winter and, and continue to do our testing. Uh, right now, our activities are focused uh, more, I know, on 66th Avenue, uh, 66, 66th Street, uh, in the 28th uh, to 38th uh, Avenue uh, area. Uh, so we're going to have vehicles running again. But as we get into your area, you, you may see a train being pushed uh, with those uh, interesting little uh, white and yellow wings. And that's basically one of the first steps in our verification is to verify that we have proper clearance uh, with all the equipment and all the surrounding. And so that, that's one way uh, for sure to, to, to validate that everything has uh, been installed properly, that we don't have any uh, anything uh, that's in the way. And as you can see also on the picture on the left-hand side, you can see the catenary, which is lifted up. Uh, so we actually also do some dry running uh, to make sure that you know the contact wire has been uh, installed properly. But there's many adjustments that are being done even before the train gets there. Uh, so... Uh, as we keep uh, going down the line, you'll see more and more uh, vehicle first just being pushed around uh, to make sure that everything is okay and uh, you know uh, diligently verifying that uh, the clearances are there and so on. And then the vehicles will start moving under their own power, but very slowly as soon as we've got power, 
And uh, uh, as uh, we continue, then we'll exercise uh, more the, the signaling equipment and other areas uh, that uh, are among, along the line. Uh, so, so from that perspective, uh, more to come. It's probably going to take a little bit before we actually get a new area, uh, as there still is uh, quite a lot of work to be done, and we still need to have the OCS uh, set up. And uh, we need to bring power to those uh, OCS. So the OCS, by the way, is the wire that you see uh, sitting on those arms. Uh, so it's OCS uh, stands for overhead uh, cat category, uh, cat catenary uh, uh, system, right? So, so from that perspective, we take the power from there to uh, bring the power in the vehicle and, and move it. So whenever you see those wires up and you see vehicles running, uh, and then whenever you have those wires up, you need to be careful. You have to assume at all times that there's power uh, on those wires. Uh, it's perfectly safe if you're walking, uh, you know, under, uh, and, but, you know, you should not be uh, uh, going across the track if you don't need to. Uh, it's open to please the eye for everybody. And uh, we, we trust everybody's, uh, you know, good common sense and, and, and making sure that, uh, yeah, you respect the trains as those trains are very silent. Um, so now about the trains themselves, one thing that's very interesting is that uh, our trains are, are very quiet. Uh, probably uh, for, for uh, all of you used to the other trains will find that the, they're much quieter than uh, uh, what you have in the area. Um, the, the crossings that, uh, that we're using, uh, we don't use any arms or, or gates or bells. Uh, so th the principle that we're using is really uh, to, to work with the flow of traffic. So uh, from that perspective, our signaling uh, ensures that, uh, yes, we have uh, the proper lights uh, given to the driver uh, to, to, to cross the street. Uh, and uh, in, in, in the majority of areas, uh, we, we follow the flow. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, it's, it's a lot more, uh, I would say, use, useful for uh, the traffic that's there, more, much more friendly because everybody is, is, is going in the same direction and we're following the speed of traffic. The only areas where it's a little bit different is when we have elevated guideway. Uh, and in those, uh, we can go all the way up to 80 kilometers an hour uh, uh, in order to, to catch up time if need be. Um, so being a probably in-road operation, uh, you know, we will be uh, traveling at a posted speed limit. Uh, we are in mixed traffic, but not on the road per se. Uh, so only when we cross the streets. So in effect, we've got a somewhat dedicated way, but it's not fenced. Um, and uh, that makes things, I think, a lot easier for everybody. Um, now, the way that, that we configured those trains, this is considered a low floor. It is a low floor train. Uh, and because it's a low floor, floor train, it's very easy to go in and out of those vehicles. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have minimum uh, uh, amount of gap to, to allow everybody to, to, to you know, uh, really step free on board and uh, be very comfortable, you know, with a wheelchair or people with uh, reduced mobility. We'll, we'll enjoy a lot more uh, coming on those trains. So next, please. Um, and, and that basically covers uh, most of the activities, but maybe one, one last point that I wanna make is that, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, work that's being done uh, that you don't see. Uh, so as, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dallas mentioned earlier, uh, we're actually doing a lot of pulling of, uh, of the cables right now. So uh, you may see uh, people with uh, big spools of cables uh, and, uh, you know, uh, install near pipe entrance and uh, other people, you know, pulling on that. Uh, so it doesn't really show, but it, this is what, is what interconnects all of the system. Uh, so we do have a complete backbone. Uh, so basically it's a network uh, which is specific to the to the system and that will also uh, allow communication with the street lights, but also communication with our signal system and so on. Um, uh, so very, very uh, intricate uh, amount of work. So you may see the poles erected, you may see the OCS, I may not see necessarily a lot of activities until we actually have some, uh, some or all of the cables pulled. Uh, at one point, you will see the vehicle uh, coming slowly into your area. Uh, first, you know, uh, unpowered. Uh, then after that, powered, gradually increasing our speed and then uh, getting our uh, signals commissioned so we can actually start verifying the, the signals first without vehicles, then after that with vehicles. So you can actually, uh, you will see that. And as we get more in uh, uh, events that could be disrupting traffic, 
Uh, we will be switching uh, time to, to do some of the testing at night versus doing uh, testing during the day. And for sure, uh, you know, the, the, the peak traffic hours is a no-go for us uh, as we don't want to disrupt all of you uh, going to and from work or, or seeking, you know, other activities. Um, so it'll be really, really exciting. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to see uh, uh, that system reaching your area. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure that if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. So back to you, Dallas. Thanks, Eric. Um, just while we have this on the screen here, I'll just point out uh, the art. So there's a lot of public art along the alignment, and, and some of that art is incorporated into the glass um, structures for the, the shelters. So the city and the uh, Arts Council have worked collaboratively uh, with various artists and with TransEd in uh, developing the art and then working to, to install it and incorporate it into the design. So this is just one example. Uh, you'll see possibly some others in, in photos and renderings as we move along here. But we're really excited to see some of that come together. I would caution you, you, you probably won't see a lot of that come to life until next year. Uh, we'll start putting that in towards the, uh, just before we open the line. Now, when we talk about opening the line, just before we move to the next slide, uh, I do want to talk about uh, a little bit of what Eric was saying when it comes to understanding the progress of the work. So we always get questions of when is the line going to go into operations and, and accept passengers. Uh, that will happen next year. Um, as you listen to the presentation, you'll hear us talking about what other work that has to occur. So uh, obviously it's not gonna happen on January 1st. So to help you understand where we're at with, with the date of when it's gonna open and understanding that we can't give you a date right now, it's just not possible with the amount of uh, work to do and the testing and some of the unknowns. But we, what we can tell you is as you watch the train move further and further along the alignment, and, and even before that, when you see the, the overhead catenary cables being strong and the poles put up, that is your clear indication of how we're moving through our testing phase. The testing phase obviously is right before we go into operations. So when you see the train arrive in Holyrood at the stop there or, and start being tested along 95th at the Stratham stop and eventually going down the hill, and in a minute, we'll talk about it, it crossing the river. That is a clear indication that we are getting very close to being able to do what we call the line-wide testing. Line-wide testing can't begin until we uh, are able to individually test each segment along the alignment. Uh, I think there's 13, Eric, or 14, sorry, segments along the alignment. Um, and if I'm wrong, correct. Eric will yes. correct me. I'm right, there yeah, we go. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> so 14 individual segments that we're working in. Um, once they are all commissioned, we link them all together and we have to do line-wide testing to make sure everything from one end to the other is fully communicating. And that is the last step before we go into operations. So of course, if you think about how the train's moving, that line-wide testing will happen immediately following the downtown segment being commissioned, which will happen uh, next year. So just watch for where the train's at. You'll, you'll see our public notifications that show up on social media that will celebrate and highlight that and also highlight the safety aspects around um, trains in the neighborhood. Uh, but that will be your indication of how we're moving along. Now, I'll talk yeah. about the river crossing in a second. Another way that you can pay attention to how things are moving as far as getting close to being done this the construction. Maybe, maybe, you a, that, though. A, maybe oh, a little ahead, bit of uh, an addition, yeah. So uh, one thing that's actually quite uh, interesting to note as well is that you're going to see the trains running and we're going to integrate the full system. So you're going to see more vehicles going all across. But uh, also, we're going to need to do some scenario running. So we're going to look... Well, what if uh, we've got uh, you know a vehicle stuck on the, on the line or uh, you know a traffic vehicle that's stuck there and we need to go around? So we're gonna be simulating different scenario of operation. So that also will take place, and we need to do a full system demonstration. So basically, we're gonna be doing dry running, and uh, we're gonna be uh, running as in normal operation. But at that point, we're proving the vehicle, we're proving improving the uh, operation crew and everything that's required to operate the system before we do the final opening. So that just a quick addition for, for clarification there. Yeah, thanks, Eric. All right, so I'm gonna take you through now, uh, quickly through a, a number of different locations along the alignment that we consider unique features. So the first one is in downtown. Uh, if you've been down there, you'll have noticed that the streetscape uh, is being constructed using paving stones. And you can see those in the photos on the left. That's uh, to replace what would normally be just a concrete sidewalk and an asphalt roadway. We're building that entirely out of paving stones, which I think is a, a really great uh, idea that the city came up with. It's gonna look really unique, certainly very aesthetically pleasing. 
there's a lot of different colors and patterns that are worked into the design as well. A lot of architectural expertise has been used to with the city and with TransEd to, to put together something that's going to look really good when it's uh, completed here. Now, the other thing that you can't quite see in the photos yet, but will start to show up early next year and even through this winter is uh, some of the amenity areas. And what we mean by that is park benches, um, some of the planting beds, places where um, vegetation will be able to grow, that sort of thing, uh, and the street lighting with uh, some decorative fixtures, all of that will be going in in the coming months as well. And you'll start to see this area really become a feature along the project. And uh, we're, we're excited to see what that final product looks like. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see just a little bit of the concrete trackway. Something to note there, it may seem really dark, and there's a reason for that. It's colored concrete. So the entire trackway along the alignment uh, in, in uh, residential areas where it needs to be distinct and, and uh, uh, obvious that it's a trackway is constructed using colored concrete. Uh, and that's to provide a, a visual indication to pedestrians and cyclists and, and road users um, not to drive on the trackway. So you'll get used to seeing those colors and know not to go there. Um, similarly, pedestrians will get to know um, some of the, what we call pedestrian priority zones. And they are also constructed using colored concrete or specifically colored um, paving stones so that a pedestrian knows that they're on a designated travel path to, uh, to help keep them safe as well. And just give them wayfinding guidance and help them get to where they need to go if they're trying to access a stop. Now, moving to the next slide here, on the east end of downtown is Chinatown. Uh, this is where the tunnel portal exists that uh, takes the train underground and towards the river. So you can see on the, on the left photo here, that is the portal, uh, at the ramp going down, we call that a portal, uh, on 102 Avenue, just at about just before 95th Avenue, or between 96th and 90, uh, sorry, 95th and 96th Street. Uh, you can see a rendering of that on the right hand side, which as you can see on the left, they're they're starting to look very similar, uh, and a fairly complete pro, uh, picture down on the bottom as well. Now, I do want to give a shout out to our our stakeholders and, and friends from the Chinese community there that have allowed us to close this block this uh, this summer for a, a few months. We're completed phase one which is in the foreground of your photo. And sorry, my screen just went uh, dead here, so I'm just having to type in my password so I can see what you're saying. And uh, sorry, I, I have Can't a trust technology at all when you need it no the kidding. most. <laughs> all right, there, I see it again. All right, so just continuing what I was saying there, the phase two is ongoing right now, uh, and that's in the, the background of your photo. You can see the, the, the paving stone obviously comes to an end there. That will continue all the way to 95th Street, and we are anticipating having that completed uh, about the first week of November. Uh, next photo, take you down into the tunnel. Uh, this is a twin tunnel, one for the inbound, one for the outbound. Uh, we did a lot of work in the last year. It's, it's basically finished as far as the civil infrastructure work is done. And what I mean by civil is the concrete. Um, we are at the point now where we are installing the, the systems infrastructure. So much like uh, the overhead catenary, now it just goes through the tunnel, but it's the same wiring and communication systems that's going in right now. And as you can see, the rail has been placed as well. Uh, on the, the large photo on your left, we just recently installed some of the tunnel ventilation fans. There's a few more to go on the roof as well that aren't installed yet. Uh, so that's going in and the tunnel's really taken shape. It's getting very close to being finished. Now on the other end of the tunnel uh, is the river. So this is, I think the next slide here, there we go. Uh, this is the Duatnau Bridge. Now this is a extratost cable stay style bridge, extratost bridge uh, is, is the name of it. It's very similar to a cable stay, the difference being the towers are a little shorter, the cables are at a shallower angle, and some of the forces and the way the engineering works with this type of structure is a little bit different uh, than a cable stay, but, but in a lot of ways very similar. Uh, I'll point out that the city council made the decision with consultation from the public uh, quite a few years back now uh, to go with this style of bridge. Uh, it's somewhat easy to see. Uh, the scale of the bridge is really appropriate for the River Valley. And when you think of it as a postcard view, as we like to call it, and you look at the style or the size of the bridge in relation to the, the uh, skyline of downtown, it really fits well. And I, I have seen some photos of this at night with it lit up. It absolutely looks gorgeous. It's a fantastic looking bridge. We're really proud of it. Uh, we recently completed the concrete deck structure. 
made the connection from one end to the other. And we're now in the final stages of uh, just some of the engineering that has to go on for a number of weeks just to make sure everything is exactly where it needs to be. Um, we have to perform a lot of calculations, which really means take everything off the bridge, do a whole bunch of survey, make sure everything is exactly where it's supposed to be. And then we continue with the track installation. So I talked about one other way of helping you understand the progress of the job and how close we are to being finished. This is that location. Now, what I want to point out here is, as I mentioned, the concrete deck is done. We're at a point now where we're doing two different things. On top of the deck, we're going to proceed with the track installation and the systems installation, so the OCS poles and the cables. That's going to happen in the coming months here, and you're going to start to see that go up uh, and be visible through the winter. The other thing that's happening is the underslung shared use pathway, pathway or sidewalk. That is the trail connection from the north side to the south side of the river. Uh, that work is ongoing already now and just beginning, and you'll start to see that steel structure, and uh, it's actually a steel and wood structure, uh, be constructed through the winter as well. As you can see in the right-hand photo, there are cranes that work off of the river berms. Those berms are necessary and those cranes are necessary in order for us to install that underslung shared use pathway. Now, in the springtime of next year, we will be complete the sidewalk and we'll be in a position where we can move the cranes out and we can remove those river berms. That is your next indication that we're going to the next stage for the Dewat Now Bridge construction. Those river berms will come out, which then allows us to take away uh, our lay down yards or our construction yards on either side of the river and reestablish Henrietta Muir Park and Louise McKinney Park on both sides of the river. That construction will happen in the early spring and summer of next year. Now, once that work begins, that also allows us to complete the trail connections. So while we may have the, the underslung sidewalk completed underneath the bridge, it really is a sidewalk to nowhere until we can connect the trail system. And that will happen through the course of next summer. So I just wanna make sure everybody understands that as you look at the berm removal, the park reestablishment, and then the trail system construction, that gives you an indication of when pedestrian access across the Watanel Bridge will be complete. All right, moving on to the next slide. I'm gonna take you up onto the elevated guideway. This is the elevated guideway over top of 98th Avenue. Of course, you can't see it under the picture, but trust me, that's that's what it's over top of. Uh, on the photo on, well, you can kind of see them both. So just in the distance, you can see a little shiny peak of one of the Mud Art uh, pyramids and, and part of the Mud Art Conservatory. The reason I like to show this photo is to give you an idea of what it will look like from the front windshield of the, of the train. Now, something that's different about these low floor vehicles is they are, um, I guess you can look over the shoulder of the driver is the best way to describe it. If you're in a current train in the city, you know that there's a, a solid wall there and you can't really see exactly where you're going. You can't see into the cab uh, where the operator of the train is sitting. In these uh, vehicles, you will be able to see that and look over the shoulder. And this is a bit of a view of what you would look at uh, through the windshield of the train as it's going down the elevated guideway. Now, as you go through uh, off the guideway, you land in Mud Art Park. And that's our next slide here. Mudder Park or Mudder Stop is what's located or shown in the photo on the right hand side. Uh, that stop is constructed like all the other stops out of colored concrete. So it's a bit of a, a plum color there. You can see some of the infrastructure sticking out of the ground that'll be there for the shelters when they go and uh, are installed and they'll be going up very shortly. It's one of the last stops for us to put up the steel structures. You can see some of the track being installed there. Now you'll notice this track looks a little different. There's two types of, actually there's three types of track that we are installing. The first is embedded. We saw that in the downtown photos and that's where the train, uh, sorry, the rail sits into a little pocket and it's held in place inside that pocket and it essentially is flush across so that you can walk and drive across the track with a, a lot of ease. The other uh, way that we attach the track is by direct, direct fixation. And that's held in place by these clips that you can see in the bottom left photo. Another, uh, type of track that you'll see later on in the presentation is set into ballast. And that's very uh, traditional of what you would see a CN or a CP rail. So again, this is the, the LRT tracks as they go through Mudder Park and they make the bend and they head up Connors Hill. So the next photo that we're showing you here is the Kahasaniskak Bridge. Now this is the former uh, pedestrian bridge that crossed Connors Road. That bridge has been removed and been replaced by this one. 
this structure has uh, been put there uh, primarily because it needed to sit a little bit higher in order to allow the train to pass underneath it. So Condor's Road pass, passes underneath it, as does the train. It's also slightly at a different angle. It's uh, created a bit better and safer connections at the uh, where it connects to the, the park on both sides, or the abutments we call those. Bit of a shallower angle, safer for cyclists, particularly as they're coming down the hill and uh, perhaps traveling at a, a greater rate of speed. You can see some of the architectural feature with this. It's, it's not just a straight, um, straight railing. It's got a bit of flair to it and a bit of visual interest. So we're pretty proud of this bridge as well. Again, the way you say that is Kahasaniskak. And that is a Cree uh, word as well, a Cree name. Now, as we, uh, we're going to jump past Holyrood, sorry, Strathern area and Holyrood, past the traffic circle uh, and head down onto 83rd and 85th Street. So this is uh, another the project on, on the left photo. That is the ramp uh, that takes the track up onto the second elevated portion. And we're going to talk about that more in a, in a bit here. So just to ground you of where you're at, on that left photo is the northbound lanes of 83rd Street, just north of Argyle Road. Uh, if you're familiar with that area, you can just see the McDonald's on the left-hand side. And if my wife is listening, I don't know how I knew that that McDonald's was there. I, I, yeah, I go there a lot. Sorry, I have to admit it. Uh, and then again, you can just see some additional uh, road work happening in the right photo, curve and gutters going on. And, and, and I guess now's a good time just to point out that we are um, well underway in our road works along the entire 13 kilometers. Uh, I'll note that a lot of the road work right now is uh, going to be completed to the point where there is just one last final lift of asphalt to uh, to place. Uh, that'll be done a lot of it next year. And the reason for that is just uh, continuity of pavement all the way across from one gutter to the next gutter and having no seams and, and, and joints in the uh, asphalt. It's just a, it's a requirement and it helps the uh, quality as well. So a lot of that will happen early next year. All right, moving on to the next area of feature. This is the elevated station that I talked about before. This is called Davy Station. If you're familiar with the old Osman Auction Yard, that's where this is located. Our Union Tractor was also part of this uh, parcel of land. This is along 75th Street at Wagner Road. As I mentioned earlier, this is the 1300 car park, uh, park and ride facility. Uh, you can see a little bit of that in the upper left picture. Uh, if you've been out there, you'll notice that a lot of the area has been paved already and we're actively constructing the parking lot. Uh, in and around the station, uh, you can kind of see a bit of a what I would call a goat trail, I guess. That is basically where the transit center will also be. So there will be bus bays for ETS buses that will circle the station here as well. So it is a, a full transit station. Of course, there'll be taxi drop off areas. There'll be a kiss and ride facility as well. Now the stop where the station itself is elevated, as you can see in the photo here, it is a very unique structure in and of itself. You can see in the bottom left photo, the wood roof structure. That's made up of individual uh, pieces of lumber that have been individually treated and individually nailed into place. A painstaking process, but resulted in a beautiful finish. Um, when you get up there, you will be amazed at the view that you have out of the north end of this station. And you can kind of see it in the, in the way the station is pointed towards downtown. So if you can imagine that roof with the view and the skyline of downtown, again, another postcard type view. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy it when you get the chance to see that. So that station is well underway uh, and nearing completion as well. This portion of Elevated Guideway, I should also mention, is just, I think it's 1.2 kilometers long. And this is the portion where Eric mentioned that the train can pick up a bit of speed when it's going through here. It's elevating uh, the train over top of 75th Street, which is a busy, busy uh, commercial roadway. It takes you through Wagner Park over top of the CN and the CP rail line, and also over top of Argyle Road, which is also fairly busy. And then it comes back down into the middle of 83rd Street and heads north which is where we were just looking a few minutes ago. All right, going a little bit further south on 75th Street, you come to the Operations and Maintenance Facility or the OMF facility. This is where the Valley Line uh, brains operate. This is where the control room is located for the entire line. This is where all the maintenance is done. And as Eric mentioned before, he called it the barn. This is the, the storage facility where the trains are kept uh, warm and, and comfortable overnight and ready to go out onto the alignment uh, first thing in the morning, particularly in the winter, that's important. The trains are allowed to stay in there and they, they stay warm and they're ready to hit, uh, hit the ground running basically first thing every morning. So it's uh, well underway. This facility is effectively done. Uh, 
we're at the point where we're unwrapping furniture is, is the way to describe this. Now, the 18 trains that we've talked about that have arrived, they're all being stored currently inside this facility. And like I said before, this is where they're stored. This is kind of normal. You won't typically see the trains sitting outside. They will be inside the barn at, at uh, the, when they're not out on the alignment. All right, moving now a little bit further south. Now we're looking at 66th Street. This is in the Mill Woods area. This area has been under construction uh, the longest for the project. It is the area that we first went into uh, in order to construct the area. Sorry, my phone is talking to me. Siri, in fact. Uh, again, you can't trust technology. They interrupt you even. So this area was constructed early in the project, and that was to allow us an area for the first testing to begin. So as Eric described before, we are actively in, and started doing some of that testing on the trains last winter. That's continuing through this summer and actively about to get into high gear. Um, I will note that this area is about to be energized as well. Uh, you'll see a lot of activity there in the coming weeks. Watch out for some of our public notifications on social media, on our website, and those of you that are subscribing to our newsletter, you'll also see notifications to tell you that this area is becoming energized. That's an exciting step for us. That means we can do some of the final testing in these, these uh, three segments uh, in total that will energize here shortly. And that will allow us to, to really launch north and continue testing uh, through the winter here, all the way into the Hollywood Strathern area and beyond. Uh, of note in these photos, some of the landscaping again, some more direct direct fixation track, uh, and then 66th Street is on the left-hand side. Now, 66th Street northbound uh, is getting a lot of new roadway here. It's It's been realigned. It occupies what used to be the old median, uh, and a lot of that work is done now, and we've actually started to put traffic onto those lanes in the last few weeks here. Um, the other thing to note here is there's, uh, actually, no, that's about it. We'll just keep going. I think we're moving into the uh, questions next. Is that right, Isabel? No, sorry. Going to talk no, about the stops. We're a actually bit moving into the stops. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. So I did mention that I was going to show you a photo of some of the shelters that are uh, get, getting a bit more complete. So you can see in the photo on the left, this is the Bonnie Dune stop uh, way down on 28th Avenue, just uh, east of 66th Street. Those shelters are, are being constructed. Uh, these are heated shelters. That's something that's new and different along this valley line as well, compared to other stops along the uh, along the ETS network. Uh, something to note here: we have a, a couple styles of stops. In some cases, the uh, the inbound or the outbound or the northbound or the southbound platforms are on opposing sides of the track, as you can see in the Millborn and the Woodvale stop uh, on the right hand side of the photo. There are other stops where you are center loading, where you are in the middle of the, uh, between the tracks. And then we also have some that are split. And what I mean by that is if you go down 83rd Street, you'll notice that there is uh, one stop on the north side of 76th Avenue and another stop on the south side of 76th Avenue. And that was really just to allow it to fit within a slightly narrower corridor uh, and just want to point out some of the uniqueness. So as I mentioned before, if you follow the, the very clear pedestrian walkways, the signage, the concrete colors, all of the indications that are built into our design, you'll have no trouble figuring out exactly where to go in order to, to get onto the platform that you need, depending on if you're heading to downtown or if you're heading into Mill Woods. Okay, so it comes back to me while Dallas uh, takes some time to grab some water and coffee. Just a reminder that we're taking questions and comments. So if you have any questions from the information that Dallas and Eric have given, please once again, uh, use your phone or tablet. If you go to the bottom, you should be seeing a menu there. And the second from your right, you'd see a Q and A, you tap on that, you should be able to send us a question. And if you're using your desktop or laptop, if you exit screen full screen mode first, and on your top left, you'll see a QA. and a If you click on that, you'll be able to submit a question or comment. We'll be taking questions and comments throughout the duration of the presentation, and Dallas and Eric will answer them at the end of the presentation. Thanks. Back to you, Dallas. All right, so we just have a few more slides to go to. I know those of you that started the presentation, I said we'd be 45 minutes. I always take longer than I say, so uh, I apologize if, uh, if you scheduled things to do differently. You can always hit pause, I guess, if you're watching this uh, after the, the 14th, but we appreciate that you've taken the time to spend uh, with us so far. So I wanna talk a little bit about safety. Uh, of note, 
First of all is, like I mentioned, and Eric has mentioned, we're in the middle of a, not in the middle, but at the very beginning of some fairly significant train testing that's really going to be visible and interactive in a way with the public. And we want you to be really aware of that. So we want you to watch for the signs that you see in the top right-hand corner here. You'll see these sandwich boards along the alignment that will help you uh, be aware of where the line has gone uh, energized and where trains are in the midst of being tested. Now, when the trains first come out on the alignment, of course, there'll be flag people there that will help direct traffic and, and make sure that you're safe as well. But just watch for the flag people, watch for those signs. The other thing to note here, uh, you'll be familiar with these new signal signage that you see around the city whenever something changes at an intersection that is controlled by traffic signals, and even sometimes with just a stop or a yield sign. So you'll see these coming up on the alignment in advance of when we're about to turn on the new traffic signals. Now, if you've driven the alignment, you would have noticed that a lot of our traffic signals are installed already and they have the black bags over top of the fixtures. As the commissioning of the train moves along, that is done integrated uh, a lot of times with our traffic signals as well. So when that happens, those signals will become unbagged and the, uh, the new traffic signal sign will go up and you'll start to see um, those lights come to come to life. Now, what I like to tell people is it's really no different than any other traffic signal. Just follow the rules of the road and you're going to be safe as a driver, pedestrian, or a cyclist anywhere along the alignment. That's simply how it's designed. So as you see a new signal light come on, you follow it. Now, one thing I'll point out that is a little bit unique and new is there are a lot of right-hand turns, not a lot, there are a few right-hand turns along the alignment, particularly in the Millwoods area, that are a, a dedicated signal just for that turning lane. And the reason for that is you are crossing the track when you turn right in some uh, some configurations. So we want you to make sure that you're following the signal that's designated for that right-hand turning lane. It's important that you do that because in some cases you may not see the train approaching from behind you. And that signal will activate as a stop when the train is approaching and, and going to cross that turning lane. So make sure you're watching that. Now, of course, we are an active construction site. So watch out uh, for our designated walkway signage. Follow those where you go. Uh, watch your footing. Make sure you're aware of your surroundings and the temporary fence. And as you can see here, that we, we keep a lot of our areas fenced. Uh, so just follow that and you should be safe. And uh, as we move into the winter, we'll be working hard to keep those areas uh, clean where we can. In some cases, uh, we supplement the efforts of the residents along the area as well. Uh, we just want you to be really aware of following the signage and being safe as a pedestrian. Now I talked to you at the beginning uh, and mentioned that I was gonna tell you a little bit about COVID-19. <clears throat> now it's been a challenge for sure, working in this environment, as you can well imagine, it's been a challenge for everybody as we uh, live through this pandemic. Um, I have to give a shout out to our crews. Their ability this summer to execute the amount of work that they've done has been nothing but stellar. Um, we've requested them to wear masks whenever they can't maintain two meters distance. Um, they are, of course, required to do a lot of hand sanitizing and that sort of thing. So we've provided them hand sanitizer. Uh, just uh, we've got on-site nurses is another thing that I like to point out. We've got three dedicated nurses uh, at times that are here to help support our crews and our subcontractors and all of our staff with any questions they have with regards to the pandemic specifically, but any health issue as well. They are there to just be a support and we're really thankful for them. We do have a number of, not a number, we have I think 11 additional full-time cleaning crews. And these are more than one person on a crew that are dedicated to go around the project and just keep things clean and, and constantly sanitized. So that's our lunch rooms for our crews. That's our site offices. That's our main offices. That's our tool cribs, and that's our washroom facility is all the way uh, along the 13 kilometers. And you can imagine there are a lot of locations. So we're working hard to keep our, our, our areas clean. We're working hard to educate our crews and make sure that they follow all of the Alberta health guidelines. Uh, we work personally, uh, sorry, we work closely with Alberta Health Services and Occupational Health and Safety and their professionals to uh, to manage the pandemic and our response to it as well. And it's been really a successful year in that regard. So we're quite proud of what we've been able to do. If we keep our crews safe, we, keep, we in turn keep their families safe, which in turn helps to keep the overall community safe. So we appreciate that so much. Uh, I will point out that just be aware it, it can be sometimes difficult to tell how far a person is apart. 
but err on the side of caution. If you think we've got workers out there that maybe should be wearing a mask, first of all, if you can, just politely ask them and remind them to put their mask back up. I mean, they're human too. They, they, they forget at times. Uh, and we just appreciate everybody's efforts to, uh, to be polite in the process. But at the same time, let's look out for each other. And, and if you see people not wearing a mask and they should be, it's, it's absolutely okay to ask them to put their mask on. I would do the same thing if I was out there and, and I can tell you that I do. All right, I think now we get to turn it back to questions and I'm looking forward to these. What do we got on the on the queue there, Isabel? Okay, so for thanks, first of all, thanks uh, Dallas and Eric for taking us through a lot of the details for the project, really appreciate it. So there are a few questions that have come up here. Um, the first one I believe would be for you, Dallas. Do you have any information on when the Jersey barriers will be removed uh, like the rest of 83rd Street and maybe 66th Street? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and it's something that we are starting to do. I've started to see them landing in our uh, in our laydown yards. I know for a fact there are hundreds and hundreds of them along the alignment. Obviously, the first priority is safety of our workforce and, and safety of the general public as well, driving alongside our, our areas. We do recognize that it, it can feel like a pinch point, but it honestly is safer than running into something or falling into a hole. So as the road work or the concrete work for the track or whatever is uh, it's protecting on the other side wraps up, those barriers are typically removed. Now it's important to understand that in some cases you may not realize the work that's ongoing there still or that has yet to come. And I would remind you that we have a lot of the systems installation to go. So Eric described crews pulling cables. There'll be spools of cable, there'll be men and women working there uh, with pulleys, that sort of thing, and equipment in behind those barriers. So while it may look complete, we know that there may be other work that's coming shortly after that requires that protection, so the barriers may have to stay there. So I would, I would caution you on thinking that there'd be a lot of that barriers removed this fall. However, I can tell you, if we can, we certainly will. Okay. Uh, next question is, will there be signage to help drivers navigate westbound off of 95th Ave to either Connors or Cloverdale? Yes, absolutely. So uh, first and foremost, we follow city standards and, and city standards are very robust and very um, detailed in what's required in order to properly sign uh, any roadway, frankly. Um, uh, I can't speak to the specifics. If the if the uh, if the person asking the question wants more details, certainly just ask us for more details, even in the forum today, and we'll make sure we get back to you with that information. Um, but I can tell you, it's gone through professional engineer design and meeting city standards, and it's been reviewed by the city. It's also reviewed by a third party traffic safety uh, professional that is independent of city and of Transed. And that person or that group also comments on anything that might be related to additional signage and in some cases even uh, too much signage or the, the placement even of where those signs need to be. So I think it's safe to say that there will be plenty of signage and there won't be any challenges understanding where you are and where you need to go depending on where you're trying to go. Okay. And speaking of design, are you able to expound a little bit more for the landscaping and design that will take place around the larger buildings? Uh, will they be, so just to kind of speak how the train will be moving around those larger buildings? The landscaping, sorry, around the larger buildings? Yes, landscaping and design. Um, you can actually touch on the TPSS. That would be a great one to talk about that too. Yeah, that's, that's a good one for sure. So the landscaping that we um, employ is within city road right of way. Uh, typically the landscaping planting beds occur wherever there's enough width um, to allow it. I think that typically a meter and a half is kind of the minimum standard. If it gets narrower than, the, narrower than that, the landscaping becomes uh, grass. Beyond that, we try to put in the planting beds and we have shrubs and trees uh, as appropriate. In the uh, two things, private property, and then I'll talk about TPSS. Private property wise, we've worked with each individual landowner to integrate their existing landscaping to the, the city landscaping. Uh, in some cases, that's been some minor design changes. In some cases, you know, we'll, we'll adjust an existing planting bed, we may move a tree, and we may adjust sidewalks. In and around the transportation, sorry, the traction power substations, that's what a TPSS stands for, trans, uh, traction power substation. I think there's 11 of them along the alignment. That's what, what provides power to the train and all the communication hubs along the alignment. 
those locations um, you'll see have a, a decorative fence around them. That's what you currently see. The landscaping is by no means complete on, on really any of those locations right now. But even in front of that decorative fence, you'll see shrubs of varying heights. You'll see trees as a way to shroud and kind of uh, blend in the traction power substation so that it doesn't look like a traction power substation. It's meant to integrate and kind of hide itself amongst the surroundings and, and not stand out. So um, again, if you want more details, reach out to us. We can we can provide those to you. But you'll see a lot of that come to life next spring. You won't see that this fall. Okay. Um... One other question, and this might be for Eric, is can you speak to some of the, will some of the intersections have full priority or partial priority when it comes to the train movement? Uh, so, so there will be effectively some uh, intersection that will have uh, full priority. There will all be also be some that have uh, partial uh, priority or, or basically just normal, considered as normal traffic. Uh, that, that's part of the design. So uh, we, we're really uh, looking to look at the min, making the minimum amount of disruption from a traffic perspective. Uh, and uh, of course, the timing of those uh, is adjustable. So that's one of the really, really good thing is that uh, if, if ever there needs to be readjustment in the future, uh, for whatever reason, it's always possible uh, to uh, doing uh, some software changes uh, to the, the sequence of, of the lights. Uh, and uh, but as a lot of study and a lot of effort that was done uh, by the engineering teams uh, and reviewing how we can optimize the, the flow of traffic and, and again minimize the disruption. And I think one of the key area that's really really good uh, on this is. Uh, again, the train is operating with the flow of traffic, uh, so really minimizing the amount of crossings and uh, you know fitting within the traffic. So, so that will also help uh, minimize the the impacts. So, Isabel, if I'm going to expand that just a little bit, Eric, if that's all right. Um, yeah, sure. I think I think what's important for people to understand is if if you if you are familiar with 66th Street, let's use that as the example, and. Uh, the north-south movements of that roadway. What effectively happens is when the 66th Street traffic is going in a green phase, north and south, meaning all the north and south traffic is permitted to move at any of the given cross streets, so 38, 34, 36A, all the, the various cross streets, the train crosses at the same time. And it's designed in such a way that it we, we do our best to optimize that. If the train uh, is at one of the stops along that street, it's literally built into the system uh, so that the driver knows that, hey, I should leave right now because if I leave right now, I'm going to hit that traffic signal at the next cross street exactly when I need to be there so that I don't interrupt the regular flow and the regular traffic signaling system for the road users. Now, there even is instances if that train was to arrive late that the train would have to stop. So it depends on the sequencing of the uh, the traffic signals. It's not always full pride. It's not always going to override everything and then turn the lights to red. So I think it's difficult to explain, uh, but I can tell you that it's different than what the city has seen in other locations and will function very well. Now, the city has given us very tight standards that we must meet as the designers of the system and as the operators of the system. And it is to our benefit as well to make sure that we don't uh, interrupt uh, the, the functionality of the road users at various intersections, uh, while at the same time making sure that we maintain the uh, the requirements for the train operations. It's a very careful balance, but a lot of effort has gone into making sure that we make that we maintain that balance. Okay. Well, that's all the time that we have for questions. There's some more that have come in, and uh, the comms team will get in touch with each person whose question hasn't been answered today. Once again, thank you so much, Eric and Dallas, for taking us through the Valley Line Southeast alignment. Um, we appreciate your time. And yeah, thank so you for everyone who tuned in. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And just a reminder to all the attendees that there's going to be a survey at the end of this presentation. So please take the time to just fill in the presentation. Your feedback does matter to us. And we'd like to hear from you um, as much as you can. Okay, thanks everyone, have a great night. Thank you.